Hello, everybody. Welcome to another office hours. I think it might be our last office hours this summer in the northern hemisphere, that is, at least. Um, I hope everyone is doing well. Um, I'm Apurva Ashok. I uh, am the director of open education at the Rebus community. And as always, I'm very excited to be co-hosting another office hour session with our lovely partners, the Open Education Network. Karen, I'll pass it over to you to just introduce yourself and the OEN briefly. Thank you, Aparva. As always, it's great to be here with you. My name is Karen Lauritsen. I'm Publishing Director with the Open Education Network, and we are a community of professionals working to make higher education more open. We are really glad that you've joined us today for a conversation about working with groups of authors uh, across institutions, which is a really big undertaking. And I know my co-host has some uh, experience and expertise to share in that area as well. Um, Aparva, do you want me to jump into introductions? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so today we are joined by um, Donna Westfall Rudd. She is Associate Professor of Agricultural Leadership and Community at Virginia Tech. Mary Lee Wolf, who is Professor in the Department of Biological Systems Engineering at Virginia Tech. Matthew DiCarlo, who is Assistant Professor of Social Work at LaSalle University. And finally, Jonathan Lashley, who is Associate Chief Academic Officer with the Idaho State Board of Education. So if you're new to office hours, what's gonna happen is each of our four guests will spend just a handful of minutes talking about their experience working with authors from different institutions to create OER and open textbooks. And then we will look to you for your questions, your experience. Um, this really is meant to be an office hours uh, for you to talk about what, whatever's on your mind. And as often happens, there's a lot of expertise in the room in addition to our four guests. So if you have stories you want to share during the hour, please don't hesitate to uh, chime in in the chat or unmute and let us know. So I think I covered everything. And without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Mary Lee. Hey, thank you very much. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to be here with this group and, and hear about what everybody's doing. Um, the project that um, I want to spend a few minutes talking about is an open textbook that I've been involved with developing. Um, it's called Introduction to Biosystems Engineering. And this project to do this book came out of a previous project that was really focused on mobility of students across the Atlantic. We were funded colleagues in the US and in Europe were funded by the respective US and, and European Union. And most of that project was students studying abroad, but it also we involved faculty in developing things, um, tool, uh, materials to help globalize our curriculum in biosystems engineering. And so coming out of that, we wanted to pursue developing a textbook at the introductory level for first and second year university students that um, our design, well, the way we really wanted it to work was that we would have chapters, separate chapters about a variety of topics within our discipline, and that then an instructor could choose which topics were appropriate for their particular course or program. And um, we do have a lot of variety in the details of our programs around the world. So we wanted that kind of flexible thing. So we got in the four, there were four of us, two faculty from my department here at Virginia Tech, and then two colleagues at University College Dublin in Ireland. And we're all members of the American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers, or ASABE. And so the four of us wrote a proposal to ASABE about seeking funding for supporting the development of this type of open. Uh, I, we didn't know all the right language to use when we were developing it. We didn't really know we were developing an open educational resource, but we knew we wanted everybody to have it for free, but we didn't really know all that. So we've learned a lot. And one of the people we actually learned a lot of this from is on the call here today, Anita Walls from Virginia Tech Publishing. So she may add a few things later as well and perhaps correct me. Um, as we go. But so what we did, we went, as I said, we um, went to ASABE, applied for funding, special project funds they have, and they awarded them to us. So that was very nice. 
And then as we were getting started with it, uh, my colleague here um, at Virginia Tech, Jack Tones is first name, um, Jack Tones said, oh, we need to go talk to Anita because he'd been talking to Anita about something else he was working on. So we did. And the way it worked out then, Virginia Tech Publishing and ASABE reached agreement very amiably about producing this and publishing together. So that was really exciting. So then with regard to the authors, et cetera, the way we set it up, um, as I said, we, there were the four of us that were, we, I think we called ourselves the coordinating group all along and it were, yeah, so. And then what we did, or the original set of chapters covered six different technical communities within ASABE. So we got section, we recruited section editors for each of those six. So two people for each section. So there were 12 of them. And then they were instrumental in helping to identify topics and authors across the different areas. And so we, that was our structure. We had the oversight group, section editors, and then authors. Um, we put together authors, guidelines for authors, guidelines for editors, and talking about it, outlining how it should be structured. As I said at the beginning, this is, this is focused on the audience being first and second year university students. And so one of our biggest challenges working with authors was getting them to write at that level. You know, many people when in academia, when we write a chapter for a book, it's like the, the state of the knowledge on that subject, and that's not what we needed. And so that was one of our biggest challenges in terms of that content with the authors. Everybody was excited and wanted to do it, and, and that part was good. Another challenge that we had was that many of us and many of the authors um, weren't so familiar about, per one particular thing took a lot of time with figures and diagrams, illustrations about licensing. And obviously this was gonna be a license CC by, and we had to get that done. So that was another challenge that we learned a lot now. So I just, I'll stop by showing you, we, the, the book has been published. Um, it was posted on, thank you on, we were posted online in January of 2021. And it's set so that the individual chapters can each be downloaded by themselves. The compilation can be downloaded also for free. And then a hard copy, or soft, it's really soft bound, but hard print copy can be ordered through Amazon. In the US, that's just $35. Um, so that's where we are now. And I just have to brag on one thing because we were kind of stunned. As of this morning, the book has been downloaded 23,000 two times. So we're like, unbelievable. So. But I know I need to stop there and I'll be happy to say a little bit more later um, about how we're going forward now. So thank you. Thank you, Mary Lee. Oh, I'm, I have so many questions. It sounds like what a wonderful collaboration with the two faculty um, based in the US and the other two in Ireland. So I will invite folks, if you have questions, please feel free to keep them coming for Mary in the chat, Mary Lee in the chat. And congratulations, Mary Lee, 23,000 and counting downloads. That is fantastic yeah. for you and for the rest of the team. And Anita, put all the links in there. Thank you, Anita, Thanks in the so chat. Much. Yeah, sure, sure. And Donna, I'll pass it over to you to tell us a little more about um, your team and your projects. Yes, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, it really is a privilege to work at Virginia Tech where I also get to work with Anita and Mary Lee and I um, work in a similar space. So it's just great to be here with my colleagues. And uh, our project started um, from a different place. And, and it's really fun to talk about how we have a kind of a different group working with our Book, we are producing teaching in the university, learning from graduate students and early career faculty. And this book came about um, from several years of conversations with graduate students in our College of Agriculture's uh, graduate teaching scholars program. Uh, it was created in 2012 and our PhD students in our college are eligible to apply to this three-year program. And as we've conducted this cohort-based experience for our students, there was frequently conversation about what resources should be using. Um, there's lots of different teaching resources out and about, but they're expensive. And if you look at all the different topics we try to address in our program, um, the pricing of those resources became a challenge for our students. And so we, for a couple of years, we said, we should just write a book. 
<laughs> so finally, um, two years ago, we decided why why not? And so the exciting piece for me in this is that um, there's three editors. I'm lead editor. My two other co-editors are Dr. Courtney Van Grin and Dr. Jeremy Elliott Engel, who are my former students, and they were the TAs for the program itself. So we all have a lot of heart in the work we're doing, and we have long-standing relationships. And then our, we have 14 chapters that were um, that are now in final. We're getting close to being almost done with editing in the next couple of months. And with that, we have 17 authors, which is a little crazy. Um, but and also we have um, seven vignettes that we're inserting in in our chapters. And I think that brings in another six authors to our group. So we have a group of people. Our benefit on um, one of the strengths of working with this group. Um, and having the standing common experience of the Graduate Teaching Scholars Program is we really didn't have conflicts. We've had a lot of common experiences um, within the group. And so anything that came up as something to talk about really, um, we've had these long-term relationships. So we just had conversations and we came to consensus. So that was, that was really wonderful. We are challenged by the fact that we are all young authors where some of our authors are current finishing PhD students, and you can imagine that their work right now. And then they also are, um, if not that, their very early career faculty somewhere in the US, and they've all been teaching through COVID at the same time that they are trying to write these books. Uh, we lost a couple of authors. One person said that during the semester, her modality and teaching expectations had changed four times. And so that had a real impact on her ability to write the book because she was constantly rewriting her class resources. And so, um, we really understood that. So we did lose a couple of authors. So that is one of our challenges. Um, we're a tight group, so that kind of breaks our heart a little bit. So now we already, it might be scaring Anita, or I'm not sure how she feels about this, but we're already talking about a second edition because we're really using this not only as a resource for students to read and utilize in the program, but learning about um, writing um, book chapters and using these types of resources is part integrated now into the program instruction. And so I see us having another version in short time, especially because some of our students now have done a lot of work teaching online as graduate students and as early career faculty, and they are very innovative in their teaching practices. So we already have several chapters we know we need to add, but nobody has time to do it right now. So we're starting a list for the next edition. Um, and so with that, we, I don't even want to say when we're done, but, <laughs> but we, I'm reading through things for a final time and we have to turn it over to the um, edit, the, uh, for editing on September 1 and we will have it sent. I promise, Anita, I promise. There is what we do. Thanks, Donna. And it sounds like Anita's game for a second edition or a volume or whatever you and your team is willing to, to put forward to her. Sounds well, she's a rock star. And, you know, we also want another excuse to work with her. That'll be wonderful. I also especially love how with your team, you have really um, brought students to the forefront and sort of recognized the expertise that they can hold, especially the, the graduate students and really thinking about ways um, to use this sort of collaborative authorship opportunity to help them advance as well. So that's really great to see. Um, Jonathan, I think you're going to take the mic over from Donna next. So I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Aperva. Thanks, everyone. It's nice to see all of you. Uh, Interinstitutional authoring has been a really important uh, priority for all of our open education work in Idaho, and this predates any of the work that I've been doing at the state level. Um, before this was formalized, we were just doing a lot of affinity-based work where we were trying to find counterparts of other institutions who uh, were interested in open ed and authoring projects and trying to figure out how we can consolidate resources and expertise and faculty interest and so on. Uh, but today I really wanna highlight a program that we just completed the first cohort of passing through a three semester fellowship program at the state. And we're now looking to start our second cohort this coming fall. Uh, and it's a fellowship that uh, we, we refer to as the OPAL program. It's an OPAL stands for Openness, uh, Pedagogy, Advocacy, and Leadership. And the, the genesis of it is that in 2019, the Idaho State Legislature awarded $50,000 to our State Board of Education to pursue collaborative OER development 
uh, they had to meet specific uh, requirements. So in Idaho, we have common indexing uh, or common indexing framework for our general education courses, meaning that uh, there's 43 courses that have been identified that if they're taught at Boise State or College of Eastern Idaho or LC State, they are effectively equivalent. They're, they have the same outcomes, they have the same um, experience, or not the same experiences, but roughly comparable experiences for students. And so they wanted OER to take root in those courses, which makes a lot of sense uh, from an efficacy standpoint. I think many of us who have worked in this for a while, we know that gen ed courses are great because they're high impact, they're high enrollment, they're often required. Uh, but additionally, they wanted to see collaboration happen between institutions. And so this was one of the first uh, tasks that I inherited when I came into my role back in 2019. And the question I asked, and we, and I, I wasn't turned away, we were given latitude to, instead of exploring how can we replace specific textbooks by identifying maybe those highest cost textbooks that exist in the state? Instead, it was a matter of how can we empower faculty and students to uh, improve course material use in these specific courses? And so we had a call for proposals go out that was reviewed by our general education committee. Uh, we had far more applicants than I expected. And I think that's one of the benefits of looking for collaborators across eight institutions is that uh, the coalition of the willing then suddenly expands eightfold. And we found, uh, we, we ended up giving fellowships to 15 faculty uh, from English, from world languages and from math. And the output uh, has been everything from a more traditional e-text that's two, um, 2,000 pages in length and is published and is modular and based in press books that folks can use to openly licensing assignments and uh, interactive modules. And importantly, the, the emphasis on pedagogy and on instructional practice and assessment and trying to scale that across institutions led faculty to think, um, you know, they might have all had preferred textbooks or resources that they were using in their specific courses, their sections of say English 101 or 102. But when all of a sudden you're having conversations about assessment and about course schedule and about the experience and the assignments that you want your students to have um, at your specific institution and then pluralizing that across multiple institutions, they found that they were really leading with that sort of backwards design mentality, focusing on what do we want the student experience to be and then how can we find ways to support one another in reaching those assessment goals and, and those experience goals. And so uh, it's it's been a really cool process. Uh, it's it's, become, it's gotten a lot of attention actually um, from our state. And I'm, I'm happy that we're able to launch a second cohort because it's proven that it's been sustainable because not only are those faculty still working on these projects, it was a three semester commitment and uh, these drafts are ongoing. But ultimately now they're bringing in other faculty into the mix and so it's uh like fellows by extension i suppose and with that i'll kick it over to matt thank you jonathan thank awesome. you matt take uh, it away so, yeah i'm a faculty member so sorry i have a powerpoint yeah all right it's done yeah thanks for yeah i'm really excited about this thing uh it took three years uh and uh it, it's basically a labor of love so it's me and uh three of my uh friends from my PhD cohort. Um, one of, you know, we, the, the sort of team sort of varied, but it was those four core people. Uh, and we created this textbook. It's a 24 chapter uh, textbook intended for graduate level research methods. Um, you know, we sort of saw it as a love letter to our like doctoral institution and sort of the, the multi-paradigmatic research approach that they had. Um, you know, we're really excited. We have uh, 250 students who've already adopted it, despite the fact that it's been in very, very slow final production over the last year. Uh, and uh, yeah, we have an adaptation project coming. We have some uh, doc students who are actually going to adapt it. And like, we we're going to go meet with them and be like, hey, we were you guys and we created this thing. Maybe you guys want to ask me. Uh, so, uh, some, you know, I think everybody here talked about some of the things that went well. I had some things that didn't go so well. Uh, so, you know, um, collaboration, our collaboration was, uh, you know, we, we got a Viva grant. Uh, 
uh, which means that we were collaborating with other Virginia institutions. And our major collaborator just basically that their work continued, but in a very, very limited capacity. So they didn't ult ultimately end up adopting the resource. Uh, they didn't end up producing as much of the resource as they had committed to doing originally. And while that sort of allowed us to sort of excise them from the final product, somebody still has to do that work now that, you know, whatever sort of stuff is not on, you know, the, the plate of one institutional partner, the other institutional partner sort of has to, you know, make that up. And it ends up taking, you know, another year of labor to actually to get that stuff done. Uh, so some of the stuff that I learned out of that were, was obviously to plan for contingencies, you know, even the like just blowing through our first deadlines, um, and building in Slack, uh, you know, even our second set of deadlines we had to blow through just because, you know, this uh, institutional partnership sort of fell apart. Um, some of the things that I really wish that I had done differently in addition to building in Slack was hiring a project coordinator. So we are a very tight group of four co-authors. We could really sort of rely on each other's work, but also I was the person on that authoring team who was doing a lot of the coordinating work. So I was doing the background stuff and the grants management and like dealing with getting funds paid at a university. Uh, that that it's, it just takes it takes a really long time and like that it, you know there, there needs to be somebody who if you are able to can dedicate that stuff or if not you need to dedicate that time that resource does need to be dedicated in some way so if you're like me and you don't have a project coordinator if you don't have a Jonathan at your campus or an Anita and Anita you need somebody you, I don't know that sort of stuff needs to come in but at the same time you know we ended up finding a lot of new uh it, oh, I guess it's inter-institutional partnership. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, we had uh, faculty transitions. So two authors moved to different institutions. So we have two new people or two new campuses who have adopted the book. Coincidentally, unfortunately, that process takes a year. Now, no one who authored this book used it in the year after it was published. Um, because we weren't allowed to and uh but through peer review through some marketing which is what i'm calling my social media addiction um we you know we were able to build enough people who are going to adopt the resource and who you know through getting a lot of those peer review comments we sort of got that first round of people who might adopt it uh some of the stuff that i'm really excited uh that i hope uh people start with are uh, some of the, some of our appendices. So we were really hoping that this textbook becomes a hub for just people across institutions. I think one of the challenges in OER is there's tons of great repositories, there's tons of great stuff, but like there's not really a central place within just where for faculty members who teach the same course to share their preparations and stuff. So we're hoping that uh, this stuff uh, or that Appendix B is a place for that to happen. And Appendix A, we have some students who have shared some stuff, including a student who was an MSW student, now a PhD student who adapted our, our exercises into a workbook for students, replacing a $50 resource in our discipline. And then another one who uh, used the undergrad book, find, found our stuff re peer reviewed for us, and then ended up writing a, a guide for other students on how to use Mendeley. So uh, we're sort of excited to see where this stuff goes. And with that, I'm going to leave it up to questions, I think is next. Thank you, Matt. And uh, thank you to all four of our guests for getting us started and sharing your experience um, so far with your projects. This is the time when we turn to everyone uh, in the call and invite you to ask your questions in the chat, uh, as Emily has just done. Thank you, Emily. Uh, also, feel free to unmute if you prefer. So a question from Emily, which is for Mary Lee. How did you all manage the collaboration on this international project? Did you all have online meetings or mainly provide updates via email or some other tool? Sounds like part of what Emily is wondering about are different time zones. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we learned time zones quite well during this. But um, so it was a combination for the four of us between Blacksburg and Dublin, Ireland. The four of us communicated all the time. We had lots of online, you know, lots of online meetings and et cetera. Um, as we expanded that, of course, then when we had our chapter editors um, were from four different countries, the authors in the end, we ended up with 23 chapters, 44 authors, co-authors from 16 countries. And so the way we ended up, we did a, we used um, shared Google Drives a lot and Google Documents and things a lot that way. And mostly it was that the four of us just tried to stay on top of everything and touching base with each other all the time. 
So yeah, it, I'm sure they're, I mean, we have some ideas going forward about how to get more efficient at some of that, of course, but yeah. But being able to get into shared drives was really good, shared documents of all kinds, because when we were talking to each other, we could all be looking at the same thing and you didn't have to share screens and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Donna, oh, go ahead. No, no, I think we're picking up on the same thing, Karen. So go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just going to ask our other guests if they um, could speak to how they would um, coordinate and get together. Was it through Zoom? How was most of the work done? Asynchronously, synchronously, sprinted. So in, in Idaho, we have two time zones. We have mountain and Pacific. Okay. And at one point, uh, we were also working really closely with uh, the Rebus community as part of their textbook success program. So we were navigating cohorts um, and, and collaborating, uh, even just in conversation with cohorts from other time zones as well. And at least in Idaho, what that ended up meaning for me in managing the project was holding separate office hours um, to basically do a second presentation off of the curriculum that was openly licensed so we could do so uh, pretty effectively. And what that snowballed into, especially because this coincided with the, uh, the rise of a global pandemic and the shutdown and remote work of, of all of us, uh, is that we, we all became very familiar with Zoom and we all recognized the importance of making time, not for really long sweeping meetings or, or co-working sessions, but making sure that there were just regularly scheduled check-ins where people could drop in if they had questions, if they had concerns, if they needed feedback and so on. And so that sort of consistent and sustained engagement through synchronous means. Um, one, it was easier for me to facilitate to just have 30 minutes here or there, even multiple times a day, even in addition to all of the other workload that I have. Um, and then it's one of those things that also a, a tool like Zoom, though I think we probably, and I think I can probably speak for everyone, but we all have a healthy deal with Zoom fatigue at this point. Um, it doesn't have to just be me who's also coordinating these meetings. People could have these ad hoc. One of the things that I'd also just, yeah, one of the things that I also just point out uh, is that the it's in addition to the tools, it's also about sort of the resources that it, each university has. Um, our collaboration and the parts of the collaboration that really worked were our collaboration were with the instructional design and educational technologists uh, with our institutional partners. Um, and what we ended up bringing to the table at, as, as a teaching focused institution was a lot of student labor, was a lot of uh, yeah, just like graduate assistants, uh, students who could read and write and uh, provide feedback back on the textbook that um, our ones wouldn't necessarily have. To facilitate communications, we did a, a couple of things. We uh, had Zoom meetings and we worked across multiple time zones within our editing team, as well as our authors. So that was crazy. Um, and we did do a lot of um, email type communications. But one thing we found worked well most of the time was that since we had three editors and so many authors, we divided our authors into groups with each editor having a team of, you know, five to six people that they were working with directly. And so we just, you know, we did small group discussions, if you want to think about it that way. Um, and we really facilitated most of our communications then that way. And then I was just sending out generally communications um, broadly about deadlines and just, you know, cheerful encouragement and, and keeping people as a group caught up. But I think it was really helpful that we divided people into groups with the different author uh, editors. Thanks, Donna and everyone else. Um, I think all of the four speakers have sort of highlighted the, the joys and the, the, the positives of being able to, to collaborate in sort of the relationships and networks you're building with, whether it's authors, editors, students, other teaching faculty that you've worked with. But Elizabeth Bat is asking in the chat and they wonder if you have any project management advice um, for a team that might never have met each other before, never worked together before. How do you navigate the challenges of starting off a project with strangers, but ending up being very close over the time you've worked together? So for us, I'll just say it, it helped that we, by design, were focusing on things that we had in common, um, at least for the individual faculty groups. They were there because they were all faculty who taught specific courses, even if they were at different institutions. And so they had that shared 
professional affinity, uh, then from there, affinities just sort of snowballed in that then all of a sudden we were all navigating collectively a global pandemic. We were all becoming much more well-versed in Zoom. Um, I, I should also say that the faculty who I was working with, many of whom had never taught online before or in an emergency remote context, they were thrilled that they had been introduced to Zoom really quickly as part of this program. That it was easier for them to navigate back in March 2020. Um, but that, that said, uh, it was really one of the, the things that was most exciting for me to see because we were focusing on um, what we want to do in terms of assessment and student experience first is that we were also seeing where assessment and pedagogical strategy aligned across the disciplines. And so all of a sudden we had math faculty who were finding creative ideas about how they could better assess students in their courses from our German faculty. And so just making room and space for those, those kind of organic conversations to happen that were a little bit outside of just open publishing uh, was hugely helpful. And I'll say it might be of interest to Elizabeth, the math team that Jonathan might be referring to comprise not only of folks from institutions, but also high school um, instructors and teachers. So also navigating that um, difference in the way these courses are taught um, based on whether you're working with high school students or college students, I think it's making space for that conversation can be helpful. Um, any of the other authors want to talk about what project management for the team was like Mary Lee, anything you had to share with your 44 contributors? Yes, well, just one part was it, it was helpful to us at the different levels to have kind of the master calendar and, and kind of that action thing about who was supposed to be doing what, when, and have everybody have access to it. And that helped with communication as well because we could individually go in and put updates in it. And you didn't have to email everybody else and check. And obviously, as you would expect, it didn't always work smoothly, but it, 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 was, it was helpful to do that. So that, you know, one good tool, I think. So I would jump in on regarding that, that question about project management. There's a lot of tracking that we do on the back end just what's the status of this chapter? Where is the author, like has the author dropped? Um, is there another co-author? Did they sign their contributor agreement? <laughs> Do we have it? Just all of those things. There's a lot of tracking that is needed to, to keep things um, moving and to keep them organized. And so some of that Mary Lee um, developed herself, some of it we developed collaboratively. And then the production team had our own things that we had organized. And so it was really, it was really quite a few different teams working together toward the same end. Um, but every project is a little different and um, the way that people work is a little different. Some tools don't work for people. So what I usually do is ask, well, how would you like to organize this? What seems to make sense? And this is how we've done it in the past, um, but we can do it completely differently um, if that doesn't work. Sometimes we develop tools and we don't use them and that's okay, but we try not to, um, we, we try to develop things that are useful, <laughs> uh, but it's a lot of that on the fly. Jonathan, I see you mentioned yeah, it. I mean, oh, go ahead, Matt. No, no, go ahead. I, I mean, I was literally going to shout you out. Like, li the, literally, the Rebus guide is like the thing. Like, you should all like that's the that's the thing that was sort of the the urtext. I know for me, uh, going into it, uh, I'm throwing in the chat. I, I did link to this before. Um, so, sort of building off some of the stuff in there, building off some of the MOUs that were shared. Um, this is, I think, uh, most of the stuff that I used for editing, writing, dissemination, just sort of like either reflections or MOUs, grant management, any of that sort of stuff, I should be anonymized, um, but yeah, or de-identified. Um, so hopefully that's of help to people. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for the shout out to I, I always find it helpful to see what documents others have created so we don't have to sort of duplicate that ourselves. I think that goes back to the sustainability and scalability of this work. If you're creating something new for every project, then you're going to find your time in the work week filling up very quickly. Jonathan, you mentioned in the chat having the shared documentation with teams and templates has been useful. Can you tell us more about what templates you put together for these fellows? Uh, as I as I mentioned, you know, we were navigating multiple time zones and also multiple institutions. And so it meant that in some cases we had duplicate meetings, um, some that were facilitated by me, some that were facilitated by, um, say, like our Rebus counterparts and others. 
And so it was helpful to have something as simple as a, a shared Google Doc where folks could record questions or ideas. And effectively what that gave me or escalated up to me was a list of these are the, the tools or the hurdles or the barriers that our fellows are confronting as they're trying to wrap their minds around open publishing and open authoring and remixing and, and how they would um, present uh, content to students, how they would make it accessible, how they would um, fold that into their, their, their pedagogical concerns for a class. And that ended up, do, that document would then end up structuring not only a to-do list for me, but also uh, what other opportunities, demos, additional trainings, I might stand up to meet needs as they were emerging. Um, and I think it was a really necessary kind of counterpunch. I've been talking a lot about the synchronous engagement, but the synchronous engagement was continually, continuously effective because they were always drop in. That was always the expectation um, was not that these are going to be required, but making sure that we also had that sort of asynchronous documentation that said, this is what's upcoming. This is what the priority is. And that way, the folks who wanted to be there, who needed to be there would, would show up. It's helpful to know what the mix of the responsive changes you can make with the synchronous, but having the asynchronous documents to lean back on um, proved useful. Uh, I know that there was um, a question in the chat for Donna from Emily, um, just wondering about you know, how to deal with folks uh, joining projects, but also leaving or having to um, shift focus to other responsibilities midway. So how did you cover some of those gaps or how did you deal with that big challenge of maybe losing an author? We decided, um, given we, we have a substantial number of topics and chapters still in the book, um, that 14 is probably enough and we shouldn't be too upset. Um, so we have put those in a, in a list that we honestly are starting to that for that second volume that um, we'll come back to those authors and maybe start working with them even within the next 18 to 24 months. So they have a chance to do that. And as we build um, that resource, then we'll start looking at this that volume. And, I, and that's because we we are part of a, a program, the students are part of a program and there's some continued communications. So we're not losing people necessarily completely out of our circle. So Aperva knows that we lost two faculty pretty quickly into the program. Um, it was a matter of this being a three semester program, uh, a pandemic and folks contracts not being renewed for the fall. Uh, and what that meant for at least one group is that they were going to have to completely revise uh, what they were planning to do, not only because of the nature of that person's dual appointment with a community college, but also with um, being embedded in a high school for dual, uh, dual credit courses, and that that person no longer had a specific collaborator for his specific course. Uh, at the same time, he had disciplinary collaborators. And this was another one of those sort of happy accidents with the design of not focusing on, okay, their goal is to create a French textbook. Instead, it was what open resources would benefit your instruction in these specific French courses. And so instead, what, what that has um, emerged to be is a process or a project where it's more curatorial in scope because there's already a lot of good French language instruction uh, resources that have been developed by not only post-secondary faculty, but also uh, high school teachers in Idaho. And he's going through and curating in a press book uh, the resources that he would use and also standing up some additional meta commentary about how he would use them and what what assignments or assessments he would also pair with those resources. So uh, it worked out, but it, it was certainly, I expected attrition, just not like within weeks of starting. It's always tough to deal with, but as, as you were saying earlier on, your focus on pedagogy as well, I think was, was really helpful, especially for some of these language instructors where they're thinking really closely about how students are responding to the materials in front of them. So they were even able to take away some of those pieces, even if they couldn't stick around to participate in the program in the way that they had um, intended to at the start. Mary Lee, did you also experience this with your um, large team? Yeah, so for us, in, in, we a few of the uh, chapters that we thought we were gonna have and we never could get them, um, revised to where they needed to be. But our project is set up so that we're continuing to solicit new chapters. We have four underway at the moment. 
And it's going to work that the new ones, as each chapter is completed, it will be posted for free download. And then at some time going forward, we'll do a second compilation. And so like with one of those chapters that just didn't make it in time to be in the first compilation, we're still working with that person. We think there's hope. We got them a co-author. We think there's hope there. But um, otherwise, a couple, yeah, we just lost them and let it go. That's a shame, but that creative problem solving is Donna was describing too of, okay, let's think ahead to the second edition. Part of this OER process is also so much of ideating and thinking about, well, we want to start off with this particular maybe textbook replacement, but we'd eventually like to grow all the way to something so much larger. So starting to jot those down, whether it's in your Google Sheets or whatever tools you're using can be so helpful. Karen, I'll ask you if there are any other questions that have passed in the chat that we might have missed. There is a question from Marty who is wondering if any of your teams involved graduate assistance in the process and if you are able to offload a share of the work onto them and if so how or if that altered your management plans and then after Marty's question I um, would like to hear a little bit more about the grant application processes I know some of you were involved with. So any graduate assistance? Yeah, we used uh, graduate assistance on our project. Uh, they were brought on as student advisors. So from the beginning of the project, they were providing feedback on the uh, textbook outline, the, the sort of proposal for the textbook, and then on early drafts and then sort of final drafts as well. Some of the challenges are students have a lot of other things on, you know, on their on their plate. Um, it was nice that we were able, since we got funding, to provide some small stipends, like $250 to students, and to really pick out the students who would do really well with that resource but at the same time these were maybe the students that we didn't need to reach these were probably the students that would have been fine with a commercial textbook that's very difficult to understand and that it might have been more beneficial for our project to choose students whose work we may not have liked as much in our class and that may have really benefited from struggling through another textbook and, and sort of pointing out where some of those things might be challenging to clarify, this is a graduate assistant that has been introduced late in the process, and it's more of a, I'm not going to have time, so she is probably going to um, have to do some of this, you know, mechanical stuff for me, and I'm like, ah, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> um, I hope you're the one doing the writing because you're the one getting paid, so... I'm just curious as to, you know, if anybody ran into anything like that. I have, I've had sort of mixed luck with graduate assistants. I've had graduate assistants who have been absolutely outstanding and people who have also authored and then there are people who have not understood press books and who have tried to edit a PDF instead of editing the press books. Sorry. I know Donna has done, oh, go ahead, Jonathan. Oh, I was, I was just going to say that um, because um, ours was part of a structured fellowship program, we were able up front to say that one of the stipulations for applying is that um, it, if you're a faculty member, you need support from your department uh, in terms of applying for this, recognizing that they're going to value this work, that they think it's a worthwhile use of your time because it is going to be time consuming in ways that we can't possibly predict. But also importantly, the resulting cohort, most of them came from a community college. So graduate assistants weren't really an option. At the same time, that became a really formative lesson for all of us because I'm a faculty heart at heart as well. And sharing um, is exceedingly difficult, especially when you're supposed to be an authority in a classroom. And a well-defined part of the fellowship early on was that for the second two semesters, you were going to be iterating and launching content that was probably incomplete in real time with students. And so though we didn't have GAs involved in the process, we absolutely had students involved. And they were the students who were actually taking these courses and interacting with the content in real time. And everything from being student fact checkers to proofreaders to actually weighing in on how their faculty could do this better. And our group does want to involve some of their students uh during this creation process just to get their feedback. So it's encouraging to hear that you were doing something similar to that. 
Definitely. And I just wanted to uh, maybe invite Donna to share as well, because, you know, the, the book that they're authoring is um, comprised mainly of graduate student authors. So Donna, I'm wondering whether you have any advice about how to onboard and sort of settle these students into what might seem like larger scale projects. Um, you know, Anita was having a conversation in the chat about guides and documents that might help. But what was the experience like for you navigating the student workers and student collaborators also through the pandemic? Well, I think uh, most people, I think, abided by the guide or really referred to it. And perhaps because they are grad students and they have this in their head idea that they need to follow the directions. And I'm a faculty member responsible for a program. So we've talked all along that I had an advantage that the graduate student authors also were students in the program. So there was accountability outside of this project, which I didn't really utilize, but they, they could see it that way. And then um, none of our authors were able to utilize graduate students in their work uh, simply be because of where they were and where they are. Um, so we really, I know when this question was asked, I'm like, I'm not sure this really applies to us because we are um, a good portion of our authors are work grad students when they at least started writing. And uh, we do have one of the grad current students in the program is helping us doing some editing before we move into press books and then she's being trained in press books and she will be the one really helping us make that piece happen. So now a conversation needs to occur of um, she's being paid, but certainly nothing stunning. And uh, so we want to be able to think about how to recognize her in our team because she's really contributing something different than others to the book. Speaking of payment and financing, uh, Mary Lee, in the beginning, you mentioned that you applied for special project funding with the ASABE. Matt, you mentioned uh, when we were planning this session that you worked on multi-institutional grant applications. And something you said that uh, really stuck with me was uh, that you could talk about the lumpy distribution of resources. And I like that description description of lumpy. So um, Mary Lee, Matt, and anyone else, um, could you please speak to the process of securing those resources and then the challenges? And maybe there's some upsides of distributing those resources. Yeah, I and I'd like to say, so yeah, we got some money from ASABE, but in the end, the way it worked out, VT Publishing actually paid for the publishing and Anita will have to tell us through where that money came from. I know they told me, but I was happy to get the money. So I have to say, we did not personally go after that money, but the partnership between VT Publishing and ASABE and then us as members in that really made that happen. And so it was really through their open textbook publishing program from BT publishing. Yeah, so we worked with um, the Open Textbook Network's publishing pilot, and this the the Intro to Biosystems was created um, through that partnership with the vendor Scribe. Uh, so the funding for that came from um, a grant from the Open Education um, Initiative at the University Libraries, which is funded by the libraries, um, and it came from Virginia Tech Publishing. Um, because they fund um, editorial production, those, those types of things. It was more than we thought it would be, <laughs> um, but this was a, it really was a, a pilot. Uh, this is the first book that we worked on with them. Um, it's a different kind of process than we have done in the past, but we are all about experiments and trying to find out um, what works, what works better, why it works. <laughs> um, and, and so I think it was um, that, yeah, yeah, pulling resources from lots of different places is what we do too. <laughs> yeah, just to sort of jump in, I think one of the things that, one of the things that was probably a challenge just for our project getting funded at all is that we are redesigning a resource that's used in 20 person graduate classes. And that is a big challenge when most grant programs are sort of faced with um, trying to bring in uh, savings for students, and, and justifiably so. Um, I think one of the things that was a bit clever about our project was that we were able to sort of stitch together inter-institutional inter partnerships, and by sort of redesigning the same small low enrollment class at multiple institutions, we were able to sort of make similar or better like arguments for cost savings than maybe like redesigning your intro site class to use the OpenStax book. 
took at you know uh, a local university, which probably would have been dollar for dollar very similar, but may not have been as I don't know. I, I appreciate it. Yeah. I don't know. Hope that's helpful. Thanks, Matt. I see another question here um, in the chat from Emily, and she says, you know, a lot of these collaborative projects have folks contributing to various degrees and different roles. Um, what strategies do you all have for managing that ebb and flow of participation and all of the feelings associated when some participants might be taking on more than others? Um, how has that, how have you managed all of that? So for me in, in my management style, and, and again, I think this is where it's core understanding um, building relationships early on and understanding where people's interests are and also where their skill sets are, because the pursuit should be equity over equality in terms of involvement. And specifically, like our math group, there's a lot of different expertise there. Math, though we have a lot of common index math courses, all the math faculty also taught courses outside of those um specific the specific framework and so it meant that you know some maybe had interest in higher level math concepts than others uh but it doesn't mean that they couldn't be critically engaged in really meaningful ways for instance one of our math faculty became basically the the latex expert because he was a latex expert and he became a real dedicated resource for the technical authoring of the equations in their book Whereas others were more bold because they were more established in their career, they were tenured, and they were interested in really iterating with students on the fly in their classroom, experimenting with things, and they were much more bold in their sharing because they, they felt more protected. And so naturally, they all sort of found their roles. And it, again, it was just a matter of recognizing um, each other as people, I, I, would, I would say. And uh, there was another group where because of the administrative role, the dual employment that one of the contributors had, she had to pull out um, to a certain degree when they were actually developing and, and curating and pulling together the resource in this press book. And it was, a, as I mentioned, it's a large press book, it's 2,000 pages. Uh, but her skill set that was um, sustainable in a really volatile time was that she, because of her administrative role, knew plenty of other faculty who could assist in proofreading and she too could more easily manage proofreading instead of actually the creation and curation efforts of the, the book. And so again, it's just, I think it's affording people some grace. And I think that we all had the benefit of the last couple of years to recognize that um, you know, grace can be in short supply in this kind of work. And so, you know, recognizing where, where people have different experiences and making time and space for that. I think one of my more challenging management situations might have been just trying to um, be equitable between the two other co-editors and um, and they have a lot of grace for each other. And at times I had might have spoken to them about you. You don't have to have that much grace for the other person. You need to have <laughs> and he was laughing um, that, you know, you you have your opportunities and you and and you need to realize that, you know, this person needs to also do the work and, and you're being so gracious that maybe you should pull back a little on that because they need to be accountable to do the pieces they're saying they're going to do. So that was interesting. I'll say I don't disagree with that, but I was also the enforcer. So it was my responsibility to make sure that that equity was maintained. Merrily, Matt, what about on your ends? Was it also an enforcer or and or someone who was taking a much kinder approach? <laughs> yeah, that was me. Um... I mean, I told you we, we, you know, we sort of had some issues with one of our sites. Uh, it was ultimately me sort of doing most of that uh, interfacing. I, honestly, I, I haven't fully processed that, but like that's not even a person that I talked to at this point. Uh, yeah, it was bad. Yeah, we kind of, among the four of us, the oversight crew, we kind of took turns a bit when we had to enforce a bit because it would depend who it was with. You know, if we were talking about section editors or authors and and kind of, we would re help each other figure out how we should go to that person and what we should do. So I have to say, it was really nice that we had a team of four that we really worked well together as it turned out. And we had worked some together before, 
but we learned a whole lot during this process. And so we supported each other in doing the enforcing, but. Thank you. I think we've all learned a lot during this hour together. And so since we're winding up, I don't know if there's anything Aperva in the chat or any unanswered questions you wanna address. No unanswered questions, but I will say there's a lot of discussion in the chat and uh, maybe eagerness within the group here today to just share documentation and resources. So I will just say for anyone who wants to continue this conversation, maybe talk to our guests as well. Um, I've dropped in a link to the Rebus Forum discussion space. Please feel free to follow up and continue to share your experiences here, even though we're almost at our hour together. And Karen, I think you can start to close us off and express our gratitude for all of the guests and participants here today. Indeed. Thank you all for joining us, Mary Lee, Donna, Jonathan, and Matthew. And thanks to everyone who asked their questions and um, engaged with one another in the chat. We couldn't have office hours without all of you. So thanks for joining us. We hope to see you in September. Thank you, everybody. Take care and hopefully see you all next month.